to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. We got a true crime podcast again today, which means I'm here with my dude, Eris Pina, who, as you all know by now, is CompuBox operator, but also, more importantly, boxing lover and a boxing history lover, just like myself. Eris, fuck us up, bro. What's going on, my friend? Um, it's going to be a good show, bro. This is like... Uh... So the subject that we were going to be getting into today, bro, the way it got broached, a really good friend of mine, Martin Superstar J, and uh, on Twitter, hit me up and he was like, bro, you should do this episode on a, on this fighter from the 80s who, you know, got caught on TV. And that's how we got busted. And I was like, you know what, I've heard that story, read about it, I think it would be really interesting. So the guy we're talking about today is a fighter from the 80s by the name of Roberto Medina. And the name may not sound familiar to a lot of people, but if you're a hardcore guy, you probably heard the story of what happened to him and the subsequent, you know, fallout from it. But regardless, it's a really fascinating story. It has a lot of twists and turns, which we're fond of. And, um, you know, it's something I'm really excited to talk about today, bro. Yeah, there's even like a like a final twist and shit, because... Uh... Like you said, there's a lot of twists and turns in the story, and it's kind of convoluted, kind of complicated, kind of difficult to understand. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like you almost got to write out. I had to write out a timeline, like a literal like notes. Oh, and oh yeah, timeline. absolutely. That's the way. It's like bullet points with this guy. But the main apex of it is what brought us here today. That's the one that's just kind of like holy shit. And it reminds you of something that like you'd expect you'd see on like America's Most Wanted, or yeah. like on um. One of my personal favorite shows, I don't think they air it anymore. Maybe you're familiar with it. Um, I almost got away with it. Where yeah, they would I, interview I know criminals. Of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, they interviewed the criminals afterwards who broke out of jail subsequent times, did whatever it was, and almost got away with it. So that's and um really good show. But anyways, you would see it would that would be something like this, like the story of this and how wild it is, how wild it is, and the risk this dude took to decide, you know what, fuck it, I'm just gonna go out there and fight on national tv even though i'm a wanted fugitive it's it, it's crazy yeah it's and it's it's actually to me it i'm not gonna pretend like i'm some sort of like a criminal behaviorist or something like that but it almost seemed to me and i remarked this to you it almost seemed to me like at certain points like he wanted to get caught because it's just like the risks he was taking it was pretty wild dude uh going through the story and like you had said, um, over on Hannibal Boxing, Carlos Acevedo was the one who wrote this story. It was, it's called Rat Bastards. He had a series that he talked about this. And he talks about... I think this is his first subject. And it was a very fitting one. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty scandalous. So it makes sense that he would call it that and that he would write about this. And it was very well written, as always. So that's a good source of info for what we're talking about but obviously needless to say i went far beyond that like there, you know i didn't just rely on uh carlos as as much information as he had i needed more so i needed to fill in some of the blanks and starting pretty much from the beginning here this dude roberto medina he was born john e garcia or juan e garcia depending on where you look and he grew up uh, in a lower income portion of Denver, Colorado. And when he was about 19 or 20, and it could have even been a little bit earlier because it's uh, the records are not totally clear going back that far, unfortunately. Uh, he was, but point is, he was sent to prison for forging stolen checks. And so when he had already served several years, he was put in something called an honor camp, which sounds pretty much similar to like a work furlough program or something yeah. like that. Uh, or point is, it's like an extremely low security program where Medina would drive a truck and water down the roads, which was apparently where this was to keep down the dust, like on the roads, because trucks would drive by and kick up dust and there were crops nearby. So he needed to water, water the roads. Look, you know, most people who live in the city probably didn't know what the fuck this is. But point is, if you're country living, this happens. Anyway, one day as he's doing this shit, uh, he literally just walks off the job from his truck. He took his stuff and walked off the job. And even though and he, he was, had six months left in his sentence, yeah, he, he was really close. Track. He was super close to the end of his sentence and he just didn't come back. 
and, and that's wild to me. That's like the first thing that kind of makes you rise and raise an eyebrow, like you alluded to earlier. About, he was like six or like, seven years in or something. Like he could have, yeah. like, so, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, fuck, dude, six point, months of prison. You just kind of write it out. I mean, I'm, look, I've never been in jail or. Right, me neither. I don't really know like that. So I'm not going to try to be a buff. At the same time, you have to think to yourself, <laughs> if you've been that long in and you only have six months left, what's, I, I don't know. But then again, do they even allow that type of uh, deal anymore? Would you know? Well, I mean, they do have work furlough programs. I know and that. I, and I know that in, I know that since the pandemic, they've had to like release a number of prisoners because of conditions and overcrowding and whatnot. But I mean, I don't know, man. Like, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, especially considering he was convicted of like fraud and shit. I mean, dishonesty. It's, I, I don't know, whatever. The, the the whole system's kind of fucked up but the point is he was allowed to basically walk off so yeah that's pretty wild dude well like carlos in the article said too when he was quoted in this he said they pick us up and take us downtown to work i worked driving a truck watering down the streets i had given them seven years and i wanted to leave so i left i didn't have any said i didn't hurt anyone breaking breaking out or anything i just walked away i mean that's that's right there is your explanation, which is kind of like, again, you know, you've given them seven years, I get it. But then again, you're almost done with your sentence when you can walk away and you can start as a fresh new person, as opposed to actually, but, you know. Yeah, but needless to say, you know, we wouldn't be talking about this if logic applied and absolutely were, yeah this wasn't any more normal you know we don't do shows on success stories normally so <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately well we we do it's just that usually they're not they're not on true crime shows anyway yeah, exactly but um so from what i read medina had said he tried to get help from a few relatives and the relatives like didn't want anything to do with him and he eventually found his way to saint petersburg florida which is right across the bay right across tampa bay from tampa and he began working as a handyman for a local hotel and then did some carpentry work. At some point, he found his way to actually a fairly famous gym, the St. Pete Boxing Club. Um, you know, if you're a hardcore boxing fan and have been for the last few decades or were a few decades ago, even, I suppose, you might have heard of the St. Pete's Boxing Club because Dan and I think his name was Mike, his brother, Birmingham, were the guys who trained out of the St. Pete's Boxing Club. Mm -hmm. And so needless to say, Jeff Lacey and Winky Wright were two fighters who later came out of this club. But uh, Roberto Medina had his involvement in this club fairly early on. And when in 1983, that's some of the earliest newspaper accounts i can find of roberto medina right around this this area they listed him as 27 years old in 1983 and they'd said later on that he had participated in and won a few of the florida golden gloves tournaments specifically the state golden florida state golden gloves and the sunshine state golden gloves tournaments um and so he obviously had some sort of skill or some sort of talent because according to him, he hadn't really done much apart from some boxing in prison uh, at, at the recommendation of somebody he was doing time with that he take up boxing. So he apparently did that. And that's the story that happens with a lot of these guys, too. Totally. Yeah, we've we've talked about shit like this a, a couple times now. Mm -hmm. Like with um, our the old uh, Jeff Sims, who yeah. obviously learned how to box in prison. I think it was by a guy named Duck, um, a fighter <sighs> who we haven't talked about, but uh julian letterlow remember the, the really really exciting light heavyweight contender right mr ko mr ko exactly he uh learned how to box in prison um you know this is, the list goes on and on but yeah that's definitely a trend that goes on there and these guys they usually come out of prison too know how to fight like they're you know whether or not they have they go on to major success in the ring they usually have memorable fights nonetheless so they're remembered yeah, and it's uh, it's pretty interesting that he was kind of so obviously he was he had changed his name because before he was uh, Juan Garcia or John Garcia, whatever it was he was going by, and so he changed his name and, and assumed a new identity of Roberto Medina at this time, 
And so it was pretty interesting that he's kind of like forming a new life. He's like creating a new identity during this time and doing it in a boxing gym and doing it pretty convincingly because I think that it was almost like there's this element of this guy's coming into the gym and he was, he was a very hard worker. Pretty much everybody said that when he was in the gym, he trained really hard and he was, uh, uh, I think that what he had said was the first day he had gone into the gym that he just nonstop trained for like two, two and a half hours. And everyone was like, holy shit, because I guess apparently that was just not something they were used to or used to seeing or something. I mean, obviously to a number of pro or people who know about pro boxing, that doesn't seem like a lot, but for a guy just coming off the street, they know nothing of training for several hours, you know, on bags or whatever. It was like, Oh, wow. And that caught their eye. And I think that that effort he was putting forth was almost kind of like a sign to them that he was honest, you know, mm -hmm. like that that was proving his honesty or something. And uh, they started believing him. And in August of 1983, I found a story about the St. Pete Boxing Club. And they had interviewed Medina. And this is the kind of the first instance, dude, there's a few photos of him in this story and they're pretty dark and you can't see shit uh, in this newspaper because they're scans from a while ago. But I would imagine that if they were fresh, you know, fresh ink that you would be able to see them much more clearly. You might be able to recognize something. And that's kind of where I started to think like, does, what is this guy doing? He's like front and center, like taking photos. Like he isn't trying to hide shit. He's just right there. And that's going to, you know, come into play in the story later on, obviously, but it, for the time being, he was not shying away from the camera and they interviewed him and he said, I wouldn't dare get into a street fight today. My hands are my tools and I can't afford to mess them up out on the streets. I've already lost one job because I wanted to be at the boxing gym so much. Um, and he said that before learning how to box, he said he quote unquote had an attitude problem. And <laughs> um, <laughs> ha he said, having a boxing club like this, like the St. Pete Boxing Club, is so important to the community. It gets kids off the street to let off some steam. Nobody in St. Pete cares about the gym and the fighters at the gym. Here we are, the top club in the state, and we could close our doors tomorrow and nobody would give a damn. And it's interesting he says that because they actually had been the top club in the state uh, for several years and I think maintained that status for like a long time. They might even still be. I, I couldn't tell you, to be honest, but um in any case he he joined the right club i guess and he also helped helped make it successful um all these team tournaments he was part of this winning team at st pete's so anyway i thought it was really interesting that there was more about his amateur career that i actually didn't know i only knew about this pro bit and about all the crime and stuff um and sorry to like you know, seize the microphone for just a little bit here. Paul, by all, bro, by all but, means, bro, the info <laughs> that you're given, this is all fresh. There's a lot of info well, that I'm for myself. So this is awesome. This was kind of the part that I think a lot of people didn't know. You could read Carlos article and, you know, a couple like Google searches and find out most of the story. But this is the part that, you know, most people, I guess, would have difficulty finding out about. In October 1983, uh, Medina went to Atlanta to qualify for the U.S. Olympic team actually. And he said, I feel I'm real strong for the Olympics. This is my big break. <clears throat> Excuse me, if I get to go to the Olympics, I'll get more recognition. When you get a chance like this, you have to take advantage of it. It's a rough sport. So many people are out there fighting. I'm in great shape. I'm not taking this lightly, but I feel like I'm going to be hard to beat. And uh, he wound up winning his first fight and I think losing the other two. He had, he needed to, to win three fights to to get through the Olympic trials and make the team or, you know, I guess get another chance to make the team. I'm not 100% sure how that convoluted system works, but point is he was good enough. Heck, amateur. Man, that was, that's good enough to make, at least make it to the trials. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. And yeah. he was a good enough amateur. And especially at this time, uh, at a time where that probably meant a little bit more than it does now uh, that he was a good enough amateur to almost make it to the Olympics which again is another reason that this is fucking wild. Can you imagine this dude would have been like, it could have been in the Olympics on TV in the Olympics. And like, I mean, you know, like they're going to well, do features point, you know, on this guy. Like you know. That he's almost just like, you know what? I don't, I don't know. He, the way he's, well, 
go back to what he said in his in the, in his quote when he left right he said i just walked away i didn't hurt anybody i didn't do anything i just left what's like Almost in his mind, he's saying, if I didn't bother anybody, I gave them seven years. Who cares if I left after six months? Like, you shouldn't come after me now. Like, I'm, I'm a, you know, I've changed. That's almost like the way he was trying to, how I almost take it, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that that was kind of like a common theme, too, with him, that he was reformed or that he was honestly this nice guy. And that's what a lot of people thought of him, too, that a well, lot of people thing clearly hid that, too, because he used that so much and worked on that, that, you know, everything yeah. else can kind of just get. And then going back to this is the pre internet, um, pre internet age. Mm. Now he can go back and do a lot of info on this guy or anything or find out, you know. You just gotta take yeah, exactly. work and go by that. Yeah, you'd have to like have a friend who's like a cop or some shit. You know what yeah, I mean? Like I'm a detective or some type of shit. Exactly. But um, you know, going by word of mouth and just going by what he's saying, you never heard of him, never seen him before, anything like that. Just know him as a hard working fighter. What else are you to believe? Yeah, he uh he it's just crazy how like kind of locally popular he got. Um, but you know, just was not recognized, but again, he came pretty close to potentially going to the Olympics. And at that point he might've gotten recognized, but he became a, something of like a local amateur celebrity before turning pro, uh, in 1984. And so he was managed by a dude named Mike Bloomberg and he fought under a lessee promotions, a dude named Brad Jacobs, a name that might be familiar to a lot of people who went went on to do a lot more in boxing, but for his first 13, 14 fights, that's who he fought for. And in any case, you know, he built up a little bit of a record, 12, one and one by the time he was scheduled to face, this is probably the first name people will recognize the six and O Olympic gold medalist named Meldrick, Meldrick Taylor in July of 1985, dude. Absolutely. What happened then, bro? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's where it starts getting fun. Yeah, so like you just mentioned, um, Medina was scheduled to fight Mildred Taylor. I mean, this is early in Taylor's career, but this, you know, like you just mentioned, Taylor had won the gold medal at the Olympics. At that point, one of the youngest, I believe, to, uh, at that age to win the Olympics, besides Jackie Fields, who won it at 16 years old. So Taylor was a phenomenon. Plus, the 84 Olympics was very, very popular. Everyone's feeling at a fever pitch. Like, America dominated, you know, even though Cuba and... Russia didn't compete. I believe it was Russia, right? Yeah, yeah. It didn't compete. Um, you know, they dominated. And the U.S. boxing team was especially very dominant. You know, they all, all the main players of the team debuted at MSG that night. And, you know, that famous uh, card and everything else. Like, they, they had a lot going on. So, and they all had lucrative deals <coughs> on network television back in the day, too. ABC and stuff. So they were featured prominently, especially a guy like Meldrick Taylor. Meldrick Taylor was flashy. Meldrick Taylor was young. He was good looking. He had all the skills. He just looked like, the, you know, the superstar of the future. And for a while, he, looked, he was performing that way. And so guys like that, when they have that much clout, that much potential, especially back then in the early 80s, they're going to be featured a lot on television. Everything is being followed by them. You know, same treatment Sugar Ray Leonard got, or Howard Davis got, or guys like that. When you win a big gold medal back then, you, you know, it's different now. In the, today's day and age where if you win a gold medal, sure, you're going to get television at a time and you're going to be featured touch, but like it's nothing like it was back in the day. So Meldrick Taylor was as big as a guy as a young prospect back then. So, of course, Roberto Medina is going to fight him on television. And someone might have been, you know, I believe it was tipped off. Someone tipped off the police that, hey, he's going to be fighting at the Scope in Norfolk, Virginia. And that's what ended up happening. So they went there and... Medina ends up fighting and he gave a really good effort. That's the thing. Um, he went the full six rounds with Taylor, got his ass kicked the entire way. Don't try to say that was really competitive, but Medina really, you know, um, won over the audience because he took a pounding, you know, he took a good one, but he never stopped trying. He never stopped coming forward. And it was an exciting fight. You know, albeit it was a one-sided fight, but it was still really exciting all nonetheless. And after the fight was over, Medina got a standing ovation. Everyone was really happy to him, but the police who, when they came to the, when they came to the arena, they scoped it out. They noticed, they looked at the reference photo, looked at him, saw the same tattoos, matched everything up. They realized right then and there, Hey, this is our guy. So as Medina is getting all the adulation and everyone's, you know, taken in and he's getting much more attention and probably the apex of his career at this point, 
you know, he just fought on television. He didn't, he went the distance. Um, if he wasn't going to jail, he probably was going to give himself more dates because he showed himself to be a good opponent, but instead he walked into some weight in handcuffs. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think that it was ever made totally clear who it was, who tipped him off, who tipped Nobody, authorities but, off, but he there's said, only somebody out there, man. he said that he had told an ex-girlfriend that he had tried to get back with or talk to or whatever. And that the ex-girlfriend knew and that he had told the girlfriend that he was with when he got caught that she knew because he felt guilty and told her, but that he, but that she had said that it wasn't her and that she, they both thought that it was the ex-girlfriend. Um, but regardless, everybody was in shock because like I said, he had created this new identity that everyone trusted and liked and he was mm -hmm. successful and a local amateur celebrity in, in, in a way, but Colorado authorities, however, they were notified, they notified Virginia authorities in Norfolk and they made the link between John E. Garcia, AKA Juan Garcia and Roberto Medina. So Norfolk, Virginia police arrested Medina immediately after losing to Taylor. And they said that they let him take a shower before taking him to jail. And uh, so anyway, <clears throat> but this, he, the, here's the thing, buddy, is that like he had no regrets, too. And yeah. that's like the same, like, you know, you mentioned how carefree he kind of is about nonchalant. So, you know, I would say about how jail and leaving and not thinking twice about just going about his life. He said afterwards, you know what? We put on a great show and it was totally worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And he's he said that, you know he got pretty good that he, that he had come a long way in boxing and that he loved boxing and that he thought it was worth going after and that it was worth chasing. Uh, and yeah, like you said, that they put on a hell of a show. I can't, I couldn't find where I had seen it, like something about the compu box numbers, but like, and it was thoroughly one-sided like Meldrick Taylor beat the ever loving shit out of him. Like real bad. I've never seen the fight. Have you? No, but that's, but I saw something about the numbers. I just couldn't find it again. I just read that they were really one-sided, you know, to the point where it must have been real bad. So, but, but but those type of opponents, though, they do get a lot of respect, especially when they yeah. don't if they go to distance. They're very dogged and determined to keep on going. <clears throat> you know, they end up winning the crowd over. Yeah, and and they can make money being opponents too. Like Absolutely, you can, you can still make some money doing that shit. If a guy like Medina going the distance with a young Meldrick Taylor like that, who obviously was trying to knock out everybody he fought early on in his career to make a statement and do it on television, get a lot of exposure, get your ass kicked, but you're not really seriously hurt throughout the fight. You keep on coming forward and just put on a really good, respectable performance. That's going to earn you more dates. That just does in general. That still holds true today. Like yeah, a, no you know, finding a good opponent who's going to be well and can test prospects is a gold mine for boxers, you know, for people, for matchmakers. So, yeah, no, quite, especially if they're reliable and they can be ready Absolutely. on like a week or two notice or whatever. Mm -hmm. No mm -hmm. question, dude. So M Medina was paroled from this in June of 1986. He didn't really wind up spending that much time in prison, but um, in November of 1986, Medina scored a decision over Bobby Van, AKA Persephone Van Riemann. <laughs> I'm just laughing at like the, the discrepancy between those two names. Like that's not even remote Bobby. How do you get Bobby from Persephone? But whatever. Bobby so that was, I mean, I mean, yeah, if, I know the steakhouse, but... if your name is Persephone, then you probably have to be a fighter. You don't have any choice. I mean, yeah, bro. At that it's point, like Vivian there's, Harris, no, there's dude. no way you haven't been in fights since you were like kindergarten. It's like Vivian Harris, bro. Like that guy was destined to be a fighter. No question. But he hadn't, uh, Medina hadn't fought in almost 18 months at this point. And so during his fight with Bobby Van, his, his comeback fight, I guess, since being arrested, he said, Medina said, fans allegedly chanted jailbird, con man, and three to five, three to five, as in three to five years, several times over the course of the fight and that he had only made $300 for that fight. And he walked away with a pretty badly swollen eye. So after that fight, he said, I'll tell you one thing. I'm not fighting again for no $300. I could deliver papers or bus or bus tables for $300, but I have to get 
what do you say? I have to get the show on the road. I have, I have to prove that I can still do it. And I'm still a crowd pleaser. I don't understand why I didn't get paid more, but who am I to understand? I deserve more than that, but I got a box. So he was obviously allowed to resume boxing. Another interesting thing about, you know, this true crime series that we do, but I guess boxing just in general. And it's something that we talk about all the time is that it's kind of a haven for, for people to reform themselves and to revamp themselves and remake themselves and stuff like that no matter what they've no done no matter what anything like pretty bro, you much always no get accepted what. back with open arms eventually someone will take you back yeah. even our um the guy that we've talked about in a past show harold ross fields um yep he was you know a lot of people don't remember because he didn't make that much of an impact but after he got out of jail um, for his crazy, you know, embezzling millions and millions from Wells Fargo, um, he came back as a manager in boxing. So yeah, Harold Smith. Yeah, Harold Smith. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ross Fields, Harold Smith. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was like, wait a second, you're you're getting two mixed up. Yeah, I, I mixed all the names up into one. Sorry. About well, that. there there's there's so many embezzlers. It's it's tough to. But no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Harold tough, tough to keep track. Harold Smith, Muhammad Ali. You know, Muhammad yeah, Ali yeah. promotions. Yeah. Yeah, we did a big pod about that and, you know, definitely go back and check that out for anybody who hasn't already. Awesome. In fact, I need to, I've been meaning to go back and uh, upload some of the old pods like to YouTube and stuff. But anyway, back to this. So, yeah, so you said the open arms for people. It's just, if you can come back. Well, all right, yeah. here's a more recent example for people who are listening right now. James Butler. Yeah, oof. with very extremely dire consequences. I'm, I'm saying, but if you want to use a more recent example, there you go right there. Mm -hmm. Guy who obviously showed who he was when he knocked the hell out of poor Richard. Um, was it Richard, Richard Grant? Grant. Yeah, yeah, Richard Grant. And, you know, only serving time, what was it? Probably, I don't know how long it was after that, but soon enough, his first, you know, first two couple of fights back, he was already back featured on ESPN again. Yep. So. Well, and, and at partially at the behest of Max Kellerman, who at the time advocated yeah. for him yeah. to be able to continue fighting and to get out, you know, early, I believe. And it's, I, 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 anyway, that's it. So I know own. that's just, that's, 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 that's Ooh. way. Yeah. That's, that's Alex, getting but... perhaps darker than we want, but <laughs> for sure. But I just use it more saying when you mentioned yeah, for sure. options reopened. Absolutely. But yeah, if you look at Roberto Medina, Johnny Garcia, Roberto de Medina's record after when he comes back that we mentioned, and we just talked about a little bit earlier about being an opponent and being a reliable opponent. If you look at his record on box rec after that, it's filled with guys that went on. They never went on to become world champions, but in the eighties and early nineties, all these yeah, guys recognizable names, players, very recognizable names, Terrence Ali, Frankie yep. Mitchell, Daryl Tyson. So. Yeah, exactly. Not superstars by any means, but, but guys who were up and comers and guys who or were contenders at the time. Yeah, yeah. He, he became a little bit more of a name or a journeyman, kind of like what you were saying that role before, like somebody who will lose, but go rounds yeah. or whatever. And he went rounds with all these guys too. He yep. wasn't completely blown out. So, well, and, and it's so actually it's funny because 1987, that's, that's the year that he uh, lost to Terrence Ali he loses to Terrence Ali in uh, January of 1987, but 1987 is the year where this like, this is where things kind of start getting really dark, but that's not something that we'll really like get into for a few minutes. And I'll, I'll explain why in a moment, but I'll recap 1987, 88 briefly. And I'll also say that I had to do some extra Googling and searching to find this. I found this on a subreddit that was like obscure and it had far too much information on it for, for it to be fake. Like, it, there's no way. There's absolutely no way. Uh, and also it had some kind of like copies of some of the police reports from around, from, from these cases. Anyway, <clears throat> he loses two fights in a row, first to Terrence Ali, then to Angel Hernandez by stoppage in Puerto Rico. And then in 1987 and 88, he's pulled over for a few minor traffic incidents and in the summer of 88, he's arrested for burglary and theft. Uh, at least one of those cases winds up being thrown out. But in 1991, um, like, so it, he, he, I'm sorry, rewinding slightly, one of the cases winds up being thrown out, but the other ones, he's like, he's back into trouble with the law. 
he's kind of floating in and out of trouble with the law during this late 1980s and 1990 period. In 1991, fairly ironically, he actually sparred with uh, a fellow member of the St. Pete Boxing Club named David Santos uh, on a card that was benefiting the St. Petersburg PAL, the Police Athletic League. So I don't know. I, I thought that that was pretty fucking funny that he's actually sparring on a card that benefits the police. But uh, later in 1990... It was the same uh, David Santos that, uh, that Steve fought. Had to have been. Yeah, it it yes, it, there's photos and everything. It's just that they their careers didn't overlap, but just for a moment there. And uh, later in 1991, Medina comes back to boxing, and he wins a fight over an up and comer before losing his last two fights, both of which come in 1992. His final fight, a loss to Daryl Tyson, uh, he got his jaw broken, and that's on YouTube. So that's, that's, you know, some of the scant video that you can actually see, but you can see that he's, he's not unskilled. He's actually a pretty decent fighter. Uh, he's just in over his head. And also, like I had said, he was 27 when we're talking about this, uh, you know, amateur period in like the early eighties, he's already 27. So by the time he gets, you know, into the early nineties, like he's, you know, in his well into his thirties and too much time has passed by and he's too he's been a little little bit too naughty yeah you know those ins and outs and getting caught up with the law and all that other stuff that tends to take time off your career for sure <laughs> you know <laughs> so had he beaten frankie mitchell in 1992 right here's the thing that would have been really interesting is that medina would have won the nabf lightweight championship and as we've talked about before on the show and everything you know or just in general Winning an NABF title or a USBA title back in the 80s or 90s meant a lot more than it does today. That meant back then an instant top 10 ranking. That in, that meant um, television time, event, you know, by either Tuesday Night Fights or ESPN or one of those type of things. And it can meet a potential title shot. So yeah, it's, it's a little too convoluted now. Like now we're worried about even just the regular WBA title versus yeah. the super. I mean, so we're not even... We're not even at that fucking secondary shit at this at this point. But and what's and what's crazy too, man. If you notice, I don't even want to like veer off too hard. But look at the look at the belts now. If you look at the NABF title of the USBA title back in the day in the A's and nineties. That looked like a legitimate title. It was nice look. I mean, it wasn't quite the world, yeah, but it was a good cardboard. And now. If, if you see the NABF title, that big baby Anderson and one of those guys is holding. What the hell is that, man? It's like some yeah, shit dude. you order from a ringside magazine. Yeah, it's like they get like the regular belts made by Sartonk and the other belts are made by like they, they just go to like the fucking flea market and shit. I'm down the street. saying. Yeah, like, man. what is this? They're they, they, they in... just kind of showing that like they don't give a damn anymore. What the hell? Well, and it was just more reliable, I think, back in like the 80s and back in the early 90s and stuff like that. And I mean, say what you want about whatever. It was just, I think, more consistent uh with the rankings and stuff and people but it getting... was but i mean it was it hold true that like any guy that you would see if you want an nabf title or usba title um usually you would get television time from that when i was young and watching the tuesday night fights all the time all there was always an nabf title fight in the main event or a usba title fight yeah it was and usually it was like the more you know mainstream titles or whatever that was what you'd see on like the premium shit or whatever mm -hmm. but if mm -hmm. you were watching usa espn you'd often see a lot of the secondary titles but you look at that uh it, it specifically at that title and you see who held it immediately after frankie mitchell rafael ruelas charm bay mitchell lavander johnson stevie johnston so i mean like this was obviously oh, oh, a title oh, that was oh. a precursor to to being somebody you know in the division so he wasn't that far away you know he really wasn't that far away at all but and seeing the, that the fight was at the blue horizon bro i would not be surprised hold up i got to see what time what day this what day this fight happened now uh, yeah it was, okay yeah this fight was on tuesday night fights absolutely because yep. it happened on a tuesday this definitely was um on tuesday night fights yeah, so he he really wasn't that far. It was just that obviously, you know, it was he he couldn't get there. He wasn't there, and by that time he was too old and he had become an opponent. So, like I had said earlier, you know, that's that's was his last fight. 
in Daryl Tyson was his last fight in June of 1992. And it's kind of like, all right, well, it sounds like more or less, that's kind of where the tail ends, but no, that's definitely not where the tail ends whatsoever. And there's actually even more than what people like, even more than what uh, Carlos had mentioned in his article. And that's kind of what I had to search for too. So but, like you mentioned, bro, and we began mentioned at the beginning of the show, this was a roller coaster. Get ready for the dip, right? Yeah. In 1996, Medina is nabbed for bank robbery after being named as a suspect in at least five bank robberies in Florida before he took his wife and son back to Colorado. And so Medina's father apparently managed a hotel back in Colorado and authorities found him there and arrested him as he's doing like, you know, a family visit with his dad. But, um, well, all right, I guess this is, this is where shit gets pretty, pretty gnarly. Cause it's bad enough that he's like, you know, a bank robbery guy. And that kind of like starts to, that starts to flip the idea that he's just a nice dude who is just reforming himself or, you know, kind of, you know, did the bad, a bad thing or the wrong thing or whatever. The idea that he's just at heart, a good guy and now trying to do the right thing seems like that's not the case, but what had apparently happened was that he had started getting into drugs and that, you know, getting in and out of kind of smaller crime, which grew and then graduated to bank robbery. But while he's in prison, after he's nabbed for bank robbery, which is a federal crime, that's the kind of shit where like, if you rob a bank, there is no like, okay, well, you know, like do some probation or parole or some shit, like you're going to prison for a while. Uh, that's a federal crime and you're going probably to a federal prison. And so while he's in federal prison, he gets hit with a charge of laundering money in prison in 2002. And then again, several years later, in 2010, a local Tampa Bay news outlet declared that Medina was a serial killer. <laughs> and so it said that he'd been tied to two unsolved murders in the Tampa Bay area from the 1980s. And that's part of what Carlos' article touches on. Right at the end, there's a quote about that. Um, unfortunately, almost all of the news coverage from this is not online anymore. So I had to like, you know, I had to, I had to search, I had to find this shit by other means. Uh, it gets convoluted really quickly as it turns out, um, you know, as it turns out, he probably, I say he might not have had any involvement with these other murders, but he was tied to these murders because in 2008, a couple of years before this 2010 report, he was charged with a felony sexual assault of a woman in her 50s. And then in 2010, which is partially why this report was written, he pleaded guilty. The thing is, the police had tied these three crimes. So there's the sexual assault and then two other unsolved murders. Police at the time had supposedly tied these crimes. Uh, and I guess they, the police reports weren't exactly straightforward as far as how, but Medina remained a prime suspect for the other murders or for the other crimes. And he also happened to live, as the kicker was, he happened to live across the street from one of the murder victims for a time, but not when they were murdered. So in any case... Where we are now is Roberto Medina was released on federal parole in 2015 for having committed federal crimes of bank robbery and money laundering in prison. So as far as I know, that's where he is right now is still on, you know, still on probation or whatever because of the crimes he committed. You like never get off probation. Well, in that case, um, it's kind of different than from other people that we profiled from earlier on that he's still around today. I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how enthused he'd be about his, well, whatever everybody knows now, but. Yeah. I mean, saying whatever, well, considering how he's lived his life and how everything like that, he probably would still like be proud of whatever he's done, you know, for his box and stuff and just kind of like, whatever. 
you know, I mean, it's, it's, but it's, what, what do you think though? Do you think that, um, he did commit these murders or do you think that it's, it's tough to go with, man, because it is, again, there's a lot of info that you have to divulge. There's a lot of going back and forth. It's, there's a lot of layers that you have to take down. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. So this, this subreddit that I found, one of the people talking about the specifics of the crimes and Roberto Medina's, you know, involvement or potential involvement. One of them supposedly was a family member of one of the victims. And so had information that, you know, others, you know, wouldn't have or whatever. And also, like I said, they posted a lot of specifics from police reports. I mean, I think that it's clear that so just uh, just to kind of be clear about where we are as far as the sexual assault. He pleaded guilty to it. Mm-hmm. And supposedly he did it after he was confronted with evidence. So it sounds like he was yeah, probably yeah. guilty. But there's, I suppose, also the possibility that he was confronted with evidence, whether it was his evidence or not. It was simply evidence that a jury would believe. So he just pleaded guilty rather than having to, you know, not plead guilty and then get found fucking guilty and then spend the rest of his life in prison rather than plead guilty. I mean, it- if I believe the sexual assault case is that he's definitely was, was guilty for those. I'm just, yeah, it, it sounds then, like I mean, it. especially when you got all the things ahead of you all that, and then like when the evidence was that, and he definitely, and you know, he used a yeah. scumbag, all that. It it but sounds it it's sounds the, it's like the ones now that when you brought up these earlier things, it's the murder ones that intrigue me more in thinking that did he actually do those or not? Not so much, you know. Yeah. So so and I and I'll talk about those too. Supposedly, yeah. according to this, person, that's what I'm curious about more is that like you know, do you think that he did those or? According to the police reports and according to this person, they said that. There were a few, and I guess we're getting slightly more into like criminology and shit right now, but whatever. Um, There were a few MOs to these other two murders that whoever it was had attempted to cut the phone lines before entering the building. And that on one of them failed, like cut the wrong line, didn't cut the phone line. And that the other MOs was that, the other MO was that these two women were both uh like they both fit fairly specific demographics and details about their life were very similar like they were both right around the same age the same ethnicity and both and something like they were both uh divorced with children or something like that you know and they had both been suffocated and both been strangled And so there were things about these crimes that matched up close enough and they were close enough in proximity to another, like within like five or seven miles or so of each other, that police felt that they were the same person and that when they did some dusting for prints, they thought that they had found enough uh, latent prints or whatever to, to match them and that they had supposedly matched Roberto Medina's prints to these at some point but that according to this person who posted, when they looked at the police reports, that that's not what the police reports said. So again, like I said, it's convoluted. It's complex. It's a weird timeline. And there's no hard evidence that he committed these murders. And it sounds like at no point was he ever actually convicted or charged with these murders or else he would not be out right now. It was the sexual assault. And what happened was he when he uh, was charged with these other crimes, he ser- the time he was already serving, he was allowed to serve concurrently. In other words, for people who are not familiar with that speak, that means that you don't have to serve them back to back. The sentence is back to back, but you're allowed to serve them together rather than having to serve 12 years when you get five and seven, you just serve the seven years and the five gets absorbed into the seven. So that sounds like that's what happened. And then he was eventually paroled. But I mean, I don't know, dude. Uh, The timing, I think, is kind of funky because there's actually, he escapes in 1982, right? Yep. 
and in 1908 in right after that was when like these murders happened he got to florida in the summer of 1982 i want to say and then it was like six months later that these murders happened so i mean the timing is very is very coincidental considering a lot of the other kind of like facts but even without those things this shit's still pretty fucking crazy man Dude, just the, the Mildred Taylor incident alone. Is yeah, alone. Like, because that's what most people know is that portion, yeah. and that's hilarious and crazy. Absolutely, man. I'm trying, like, I'm racking my brain too from like boxing and wrestling, trying to think of another situation where something like similar to that like happened. And I, it's not something I can just come up with off the top of my head. Like, I'm sure you know I have to like do research on that right now because that's just like it's. The fact that, like, when you know, too, that <clears throat> most people you watch, if you're a person that's in the true crime and everything like that, most people, if you watch all these shows, you realize that most criminals are extremely paranoid when they escape prison or they're out or whatever it is because they're all constantly thinking someone's watching them or even if they're really far away from their or they broke out of, they're still always constantly watch themselves. And like we alluded to, this is a card that, in the 80s, everyone was watching boxing on the Wide World of Sports or whatever network was going to be shown on that weekend. And this was the 84 Olympics, the Olympians that were coming out of it that were very popular and being featured prominently on television. A lot of eyes were going to be watching this. So, of course, you know, for a person who got out of prison, who's still on the lam and, you know, has an open, open cases against them, everything like that, you go out there and then you fight on national television fucking wild and, he could, dude. and it's almost like too that if he wasn't if the cops weren't tipped off he might have got away with that and and on uh i think we i we both forgot a slight detail that's a nice little tidbit about the tattoo okay th th that's how he got recognized yeah, i don't think yeah, i don't right. know if either of us mentioned that but but yeah, it was the tattoo that it was, yeah, that's how the cops matched him up, right? Yeah, yeah, because he had changed his look sufficiently that he didn't really look like the same guy anymore because he like had a different facial hair and did his hair differently. But he, it was his tattoo that matched and that that's how he wound up being identified by police. And then later on, when he was caught for the bank robberies, he wound up being identified on a crime show or like, or they on the news, they had showed his, his uh, photo when they were reporting on the crime and somebody recognized him on the news too. So yeah, as cavalier as he was, dude, that's what's so crazy is that you, you said like, you know, most people would be like hiding out or some shit. And he was just like, Nope, I'll be on the news. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, I want to watch that fight, not because you're going to see him actually get arrested afterwards and anything, but I'm just kind of curious to see the whole thing unfold in general. Yeah, if you could like see well, cops ringside or something, or just some. I mean, I bet you they're, you know, I'm, I'm sure they were in plate, like they were like undercover and just or whatever it might have like been. Like whistling to him or some shit between rounds. Like, <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> it's, it is wild, man. But yeah, that's that's what kind of brought everything full circle is that, like his nonchalant attitude too after being caught was that like, hey, we put on a hell of a show. I'm proud of what I did. Like it almost to him that it was worth it. Yeah, dude. Uh, it, it was it's... worth going back and being busted as opposed to just staying out and living a, you know, a normal life, whatever that may be. Yeah. Like, or, and what's crazy too, is I guess like he could have just, he could have just been like a fucking bum. Like, and just, but I mean, like he could have like made some money, but like not been on TV or, you know what I'm saying? Like been like a, a fighter who's like okay but like just fight somewhere else so you're not there's no danger of being on tv or don't try so hard or don't be so good or something <laughs> but i mean you know i guess he just couldn't that's probably again not to say i'm some fucking criminologist or some shit but there's probably some element of like narcissism there where he believed that he could get away with these things. Like he, he believed he could get away with the crimes and then he probably believed that he could get away with reinventing himself. But I mean, anyone who just nonchalantly walks away from only having served six months left on their sentence is uh, definitely is a little off. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it's getting there in the first place. Yeah, is a problem. Yeah. 
I mean, obviously, but just like the way you're just doing that and now thinking yeah. twice about it is. Uh... Yeah, it's it's so it's a it's a pretty wild tale, man. I don't know where Roberto Medina is these days. I don't know if we if but anybody it has with the craziness of the '80s in general, man. We've the, we've touched on it. Hell, we can do a discussion for a month on all the wild things that happened in boxing in the 1980s. This is just a small footnote that we touched on today. It's a lot of you cocaine. I mean? So a lot yeah. of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a small footnote of what we touched on and what's actually really been going down over, you know, throughout the entire decade. Like, I mean, that was the decade of gluttony and craziness in general, all all throughout the world in the spectrum. But boxing had a lot of stuff going down, man. Just a lot of it some of these stories were really popular and well known a lot of them are not you know and it's um it's interesting to go by and always discover new things and read about them and just like you know eye-opening things and you're just kind of like holy shit like i'm always constantly reading about new fighters that i wasn't aware of um because there's just not a lot out there on them you know and then you hear about some black story on them and you're just kind of like wait what and the first thing i'm going to do is send it to you (laughs) <laughs> yeah dude we uh, yeah well we like just kind of enjoying the just the weird tales the crazy tales salacious stuff i mean it's i don't know i i guess it's just life it's just that viewing it through the lens of something we love in boxing because boxing such like we said a haven for it is it. They, they welcome this with open arms it's been like that since the uh, the end you know the inception of the sport more or less especially when it started being like really documented yeah yeah, and I'm and actually, uh, you know, I damn, I I almost thought it would take us longer to get through this story, but it's just that he, there are so many gaps and there's so many ways in which it's like tough to really nail down some of the facts because of how crazy it is and because of I guess just how long ago it was. There's not a whole lot of you know hard evidence and uh, newspaper artic- articles for some of it, but even so, dude um no yeah. just like the what the the portions that they're there man give you give you it all at that most yeah. you know what I mean? totally. and like that's that's some crazy like again that one incident with the melder taylor thing right there is its own documentary that you can make and like that would be featured on television and like you know a guy like you i was surprised he hasn't been featured in for anything for doing something for something like that happening because that's a wild story in itself you know, a lot of people who have done, uh, who had stunts that got a lot less attention have been featured instead. I mean, you know, so, but then again, maybe he's a guy that just wants, I mean, who, you don't know the story. All he, like you said, we don't know where he is. You don't know what really happened to him, but as far as you know, he's still out. And um, yeah, that's where it's at with him. But it's interesting in itself because it's, for such a crazy story unless you're a really hardcore follower of the sport you were around back in the 80s really following the sport and so you read about this subsequently afterwards whatever it may be it's not something that's ever been discussed or really talked about you know besides carlos's excellent article and a couple of tidbits here and there you never heard of this thing i certainly had it before that too and the fight with Meldrick taylor as far as i know i've looked it up i can't find it on youtube i haven't seen on other you know another outlet so yeah, you know, a guy like Roberto um, Medina, Johnny Garcia, whatever his real name may actually be, he's still very shrouded in mystery, besides a few key points. And with that, it's, you know, those key points are so interesting that, you know, you want to talk about it. Yeah, and hopefully kind of turn over a few rocks in the meanwhile. And, you know, I, I definitely learned a bunch of shit I didn't know. So hopefully, yeah, people- man, this was this was this was great. This was a really fun one to to go in about. And speaking of, you know, we have a few other guys that we've been talking about. Um, a couple other dudes from the '80s that I brought up to you. Uh, that's wild. <laughs> and even going far back to what we're what we've been usually featuring because we've been featuring guys more present uh, in the. In the more modern era, we even have, you know, way, way back from, uh, you know, 50s, 40s, stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, dude, we, uh, we've we discussed actually a whole whole number of kind of cases and fighters and stuff like that. So I think that we'll have a, a, pretty, a pretty good, like, smorgasbord of true crime things to, to come. And I know that uh, I mentioned this on, on social media, but 
uh, Bryn and I will probably be doing some of these occasional, you know, old fight rescoring type of things. And we're going to be doing Leonard Hagler just because that's a controversial fight that nobody ever seems to get, <laughs> nobody ever seems to agree on. But dude, there's there's a lot of stuff that we got coming, and I'm, I'm gonna be 35 I'm this years week. this year, right? Oh my gosh, I know, dude. 87, 35 gosh, years, and people shit. are still fighting about that, bro. I dare anybody, anybody, if you listen, I dare you to go to Boston or any part of like up, you know, Southern Mass, Northern, whatever, Brockton area. Don't go to Brockton; you might get killed still. But like, go to parts and find an old head. Go to one of those old school bars. Find some old heads. That probably you know around back in that era and tell them that marvelous Marvin Hagler lost that fight and see. If oh you God! <laughs> no. See what happens. Don't do it <laughs> unless you're armed or something. Don't do it. Jesus. Yeah, they, dude. They, they even when I was a kid and um those you know a lot of people were still active in the gyms and other stuff that were like you know diehard Hagler guys. <laughs> Whenever they mention that fight, that freaking Sugar Ray Leonard, I can't stand him. He's a fucking bum. Hagler beat his ass. Like, you know, mm-mm. so. Yeah, dude. They have people that fight's going to be like debated from 100 years from now. Still, who won that? Who actually won that? People do not, the Hagler people do not like Ray Leonard. That's for sure. But no, nah, I mean, it's, uh, no, nah, it's, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun, dude. I appreciate you, you know, doing doing what you do dude it was a it's a, a good true crime episode oh yeah this was a good time and you know looking forward fresh out the box for 2022 let's keep them rolling for sure man well everybody who listened in to this true crime episode we appreciate you thank you so much and if you wouldn't mind to go ahead and subscribe if you watched on youtube subscribe there if you listened on whatever podcast app you listened on subscribe there throwing us a rating or a comment is also appreciated but uh, also if you are on social media and come on don't lie you probably are if you are on twitter for instance follow my boy eris pina at punch zone eris follow me patrick connor at patrick m connor we're also on facebook instagram and those kinds of things but eris we'll talk soon bro absolutely thanks everyone all right later people